Hello everyone and welcome to this TradeSim TV video. This is Mark. Today we're taking a look at a scenario pack by Sinks. It's a free scenario pack containing 10 scenarios which provides 12 hours of play on the railways of Devon and Cornwall. It is a scenario pack that is set loosely in the year 1980 uh, and provides some really uh, different uh, opportunities to drive this great route. Uh, it's a pack that I've been wanting to try for a few weeks since Sinks released. I think it was about two or three weeks ago since he released the pack. And I've been wanting to try it ever since because it's something that really appeals to me. Uh, and he's told me, you know, when he was making it about the pack, it was something that uh, I was really interested in because, as he knows, I love the Devon scene and uh, his scenarios particularly are really good. So, looking forward to see what we get here. It's one of the scenarios. I think Tom's actually streamed this scenario as well. But for me, it's the pick of the bunch and it's a run to Plymouth, so it's uh, something nice to do. So, the, uh, the description on the screen says, Afternoon Driver. You would be on standby now, but unfortunately, as per the norm, the Classic 46 hiding the 1v62 Birmingham New Street to Plymouth service has failed. Therefore, you'll be calling in to rescue her and finish the job. Follow the instructions in your briefing and couple up to the failed local Exeter. The passengers have boarded already, so once you couple up and prepare for the trip south, you are free to go. You'll call at Dawish, Teenmouth, Newton Albert and Tottenham Send route to Plymouth. We start just over 20 minutes late, so there's barely any chance of you being able to stay to the timetable of arrivals and departures, so just drive to the best of your ability. However, potential can be had if you arrive at Newton Abbott within your timetable loop stop of 11.54 to 12.05. Uh, and I believe that stop will be to connect with another service, possibly to Paynton. Please note the points in the extra depot are manual, so you must ensure they're set correctly, and that's so you don't end up falling off the track. Uh, need to, may need to press tab to spot a signal or two. Enjoy. So our loco for this working is 50028 Tiger and we'll be collecting the class 46 from just over on the uh, middle over there, platform 4 I guess it's in. Of course the track light on stuff X is vastly different in this scenario as it's based in the modern era Oh, what am I doing? Compared to how it would be in 1980, but it's just something fun and it's just something nice to do because otherwise we can't do it in TS. So you got to use your imagination a little bit, but I have absolutely no issue with doing that at all. I uh, always love driving some of the heritage scenarios. So, first of all, I'm going to set the cab up. Putting the AWS uh, isolation switch up. Already got the engine key on. Move it to engine only and forward. Next up, hold an R and the brake release key to release the brakes and wait for the gauge to go round. In the meantime, whilst that's happening, I'm going to prepare the take the tail lights off, put the route indicator on, and then the headlight switch is this one. That's the headlights on, so we're all set ready to go. I'm going to open the window because it is a nice hot day in July. It like some of the great weather we've had in the UK at the moment, unfortunately. None of us are actually able to go out and enjoy it, but uh, the main thing at the moment in uh, real life is that I hope everyone's staying safe and well, um, and that everyone's staying together through this period. I'm sure life will return to normal. Hopefully in the next few months or so. Got another three months of lockdown, uh, three weeks of lockdown though as I uh, do this. So just moving forward out of the uh, depot here. I'm going to couple onto the peak which you can just see through that left hand window. I want to take it to Plymouth. We've got a, I've just tapped the signal there because I wasn't sure if it would clear or not. And it said we were approved so we should be fine. We're just moving out of Exeter Depot here. Back in the day, they used to keep a locomotive at Exeter um, in the loco yard there quite often for standby duties because quite often locos had turned up at Exeter and failed on a condition that certainly wasn't fit to get them over the South Devon banks. Um, quite often it would be HSTs that would end up being dragged over the uh, Devon banks, but peaks certainly uh, weren't unknown to fail. So 
we're just going down to the XD yard head shunt to see a shunt point, which is a mark on the track just down here. Just past the signal that controls entry to St. David's Station. Of course, in 1980, all this was semaphore. The semaphore signals at uh, St. David's didn't go until March 1985, I believe it was, when they started resignaling St. David's itself. Before that, there was X to West signal box at this end of the station, used to control movements at this end, and then you had another box, uh, Exeter City Basin as well. So we're going to have to change ends here, so I always forget the uh, procedure for this, but we'll just pretend I know what I'm doing, even though I don't. We'll put the brakes into shutdown position. Make sure we turn the headlight off. And then it's a case of who indicator off, tail lights on. And then we need to go back into the car at the other end. Oh, we didn't move the switch there. And the, is there a change end switch as well? Can move there is in this one or not? I think I'm clear to change ends. So put the AWS switch in again. I cancel the AWS engine key in. Forward. Headlight on. Need to turn the tail lights off. Indicator on. Tail lights off. Not going to bother with any windows or anything. Just going to tab the signal with the tab button, which gives me the permission to proceed. It's actually a control and tab that I need to press though, so I've pressed control and tab and you can see now the little shunt light is lit up for us, so we're clear to do the shunt move back into the station. Hold R and the brake release key again to release the brakes. Just waiting for that gauge there, the brake pipe one, to reach the red line. And then we know the brakes are off. And then we're just waiting for the ones on the left hand bogey uh, Side to go off, and there they are. So now we're fully clear to move. And these are shunts that they used to do on a regular basis, moving locomotives onto trains. And this, the procedure of having a Thunderbird down in Devon didn't actually end until uh, I want to say around 2004 ish. Because even when they started the version 47s and then the uh, first Great Western 47s as well on local services. They used to keep a VES 47 or an EWS 47 or similar at Newton Abbott, usually in the bay platform there. Uh, also on the Heathfield branch spur, they've been known to keep locos as well. And that was after they'd actually stopped using Exeter Depot as a stable and point for locomotives. It seemed that Newton Abbott would become the more regular location for the area's Thunderbird to be kept. And nowadays, when they're with Thunderbirds, they don't seem to have that many of them, to be honest. Uh, I think Penzance is probably the closest actual passenger loco with the Sleeper 57. Usually I'll have a 66 at uh, St Blasey and maybe even in Versailles Yard as well with the freight service that comes from Westbury. I'm just coupling up to the peak. There we are. So, as Sinks' message said at the start, we're clear to depart as soon as we've had here. So, first thing to do is to put the reverse into off, take the master key out, headlights off, new indicator off. I'm not putting the tail lights on, obviously, because we're facing against another loco. Brakes need to go into shutdown. And I believe. Releasing the loco brake and then the AWS switch is off. Oh, we're in the peak there. There we are. So we got the reverser on there. Oh, many bad things are happening. Now, I wonder if that's because I went into the peak cab. Hmm. 
it would seem that this is broken because I went into the peak cap. So if you do this scenario, make sure you don't make the same mistake I did. Let's see what happens here. Take the tail lights off. See if it actually moves when I do this. I've got a feeling the peak may actually power with us here. Well, the brakes are released. Do a brake test before we set off. Seem to be working. Alright, let's see what happens and I move the power on them. Nothing. Okay, I'm going to go in scenario editor, restart the scenario, um, and see if I can work out why that's happened. Uh, right, I've just been in scenario editor and restart the scenario. Then I realised that maybe I've been a massive burke and not actually put the engine key in to start the loco. And I think that's what it was. I think I hadn't done the engine key. So I'm a massive burke. Not that any of you needed to know that anyway because you probably already knew. But anyway, we're now ready to leave Exeter. So release the brakes. Reverse it forward, I'll set up. Quick blast on the horn. Check back down the train. Away we go. So next stop for us now is Dawlish. And we're going through to Plymouth, which is 51 miles away. If we can do that in around an hour, we'll be doing pretty well. Gonna fix my sound. I believe the sound might be a bit quiet. Should be a lot better now. I think Sink said we need to try and get to New Abbott for the 12.05 departure time, so we're going to be, be lucky if we can do that 18 minutes, including a stop at Torsh and Timmouth. I think we'll be lucky if we can manage that. Borderline. Check for when the, the train's getting towards that speedboard. The train that we're working in is 1V62, the 0815 Birmingham Plymouth. A lovely wake of Mark 1's behind us as well. So now going on to the 75 mile an hour limit. Going through extra St Thomas. Pretty flat going in, so normally. Passing a 47 in the other direction. In terms of what stock we're using, we're using, of course, the Bossman Games Class 50 up top. And then the peak is the RSC DTG model, a high HH model as well, I guess. Uh, it's 46017. And the V skin is from Vulcan Productions website. And then the Mark 1s that we've got behind us. Uh, the Mark 1s that you get from Armstrong Powerhouse, Mark 1 Pack Version 1, Volume 1. We've got a nice long rake of those. Already nice up to 67 miles an hour as we head out now. Along the uh, floodplains, away from Exeter towards Powdrum, Nextminster. Mm -hmm. 
course, when this route is set is uh, modern day. When the scenario was set is 1980, so in 1980 there was a lot less foliage along here, as you'll see in the 1985 route that I did uh, with Vulcan Productions. Track wise, it's pretty much the same. Signaling, it's not that much different. There would have been less sections because there would have been a, there was a signal box at Exeter for semaphore signals. But overall, it's uh, fairly similar in terms of track layout. The loops and stuff at Exeter have gone now. Speed limit wise, it's pretty much the same as it was in 1980. Full power now as we head along the levels. So this is Exminster, which is where there used to be a station um, until the beach near basically. There used to be some uh, sidings and stuff here as well. where the station used to be. Closed in the 1960s as I said. And we now head along to the power room which is where we come alongside the X uh, Astra with Rex. Doing quite well to say we've got this peak in tow and uh, uh, quite a long train as well up to 85 miles an hour. Nice long blast on the own. So for those that watched the video of the mana class that I did a few weeks ago, this is where powder and troughs used to be. There's actually in real life still a little bunker thing, um, like a almost like a pillbox. You can actually see where the um, water troughs were in the game. It's not re recreated, but uh, there is actually still signs of where it used to be. So we're now coming down towards. Powder, which is where we start on the 75 mile an hour limit because of the curves we go along to inside the uh, I think it's the Earl of Devon's estate. I think it's the Earl of Devon. Maybe I'm just making that up. Just some, some bloke with a load of money. He lives up there in a great big castle. So, yeah, we're going alongside the uh, estuary now. You can see right across over the other side towards Exmouth, and that's actually in the game as well. In the railways of Devon and Cornwall route. Passing another 50 on a uh, up service. There's that posh bloke's castle. We're now headed towards Starcross, which is where the atmospheric uh, railway pumping station is. And that was a scheme set up by Brunel, it was a short lift scheme, where there was a pipe led between the tracks. Uh, it was actually used as like an air system for trains on the uh, South Devon Railway. They had pumping stations, I know they had one here. I know they had one at the top nest, but I can't actually remember where the other ones were. Certainly an interesting uh, method, it was when it was broad gauge, I think. I'm not using Wikipedia or anything for this, so a lot of it could be just speculation. <laughs> but that was that's my understanding anyway. 
It wasn't very successful and it, it really didn't last very long at all. I think it was still in the 1800s. Do a bit of window hanging as we go down this section. Turn the volume up. Of course, in the days when this scenario is set, Dawlish Warren had its own signal box. This section uh, was a long section all the way from Powder, uh, all the way from Exminster, sorry, to Dawlish Warren. So trains up, ended up being quite spaced out along this section, obviously. And that's the main advantage of uh, call light signals that were introduced after 1986, sort of 1986-87 time on this section. We get down to 70 miles an hour for the uh, Langston Rock Curve. The signal box used to be just there on the left. And in a second we need to prepare for our first stop at Dawlish. Get like a thumbnail pick coming on here. So we're gradually heading now down the seawall. Just trying to pick a braking point. Probably going to break just after I go under the Rockstone Bridge, which is ahead of us. It looks like there's a HST going towards Paddington in the opposite direction. Or maybe not Paddington. Let's see, press F6, see where it's going. No, no nothing happening. It's going nowhere. That could be a cross country one, actually. No, it is, it is a Paddington band one. Instead of worrying about where the HST is going, maybe I should worry about slowing down instead. It should be fine. Probably overdone it now a little bit. So Dawlish signal box used to be located just about halfway down that platform on the right. Finally got taken away about, uh, I want to say about seven or eight years ago. But back in uh, the time when this scenario was set, it was uh, still in use. In the mid 80s it used to actually only switch in when there was something uh, major happening. Like on a summer Saturday or whatever I believe, and during busy periods. wasn't actually open all the time. I feel like the uh, thumbnail pit might happen here, actually, to be honest. Note to self, when you stop at the station, remember to actually open the doors. Oh, that was a, a very quick stop. Turn the sound up while we're here.
kind of seems a little bit um, extreme blowing the horns for all those sunners, but they did actually used to do that uh, quite often back in the days when horns were mandatory for tunnels. I always remember going along on units or whatever and just hearing the constant tones as you go in and out of the tunnels. And then usually a longer tone as you went into uh, into Parsons Tunnel, which is this one. We're going to be just outside the 12.05 window. No new now, but it'll be about 12.07 I expect. So now on the Team Muff Seawall. And there's a signal box. Back in the day there was a signal box at Tim Muff. And that would have been controlling a semaphore, sort of roughly where those call lights are, just a bit further around the corner. Back uh, in the 80s, or until the 80s, rather. Just going to find a little power up. Getting massively triggered by that flowing fence on the right hand side over there. Well, not massively triggered. A bit extreme. So yeah, there used to be some semaphores here. How they ever never got washed away by the sea, I don't know. So I'm going to drop the brakes in super late here. Hopefully we can actually slow down in time. Again, I've probably overdone it a little bit. You can't actually really slam them on. The signal box used to be located at the end of this platform on the uh, the left-hand side. I've gone from overdoing it to now overshooting it. However, oh, maybe we'll be okay. Because you've got the second loco behind us, we'll be fine. Another train coming the other way as well. See, that signal should have stayed green, I think, a little bit longer, because it's gone to bed before we even got to it. I think that's a world record stop there. That's that stop activated. Literally, 10 seconds after we uh, arrived. So now I dealt uh, along the Teen Astra. It was here on the left, they used to require a lot of sidings and stuff, and China Clay. I think China Clay still actually goes in by boat into this uh, dock here. Because there's actually a lot of China Clay industry still remaining at the top end of this valley. So, where we turn off to New Albert, on the uh, left, the branch that goes to Heathfield, that branch used to have some clay workings up there. And the uh, actual quarries and stuff are still open. And indeed in some of those you can actually still see where the track uh, is under the concrete and whatever. So now up onto the 80 mile an hour limit, then onto the 90 mile an hour limit. For a quick thrash along the uh, teen estuary. We were doing to about 12.04. I think we were actually doing it 11.54 on these real life timings. Maybe 12.04, we were expected to be there 12.04, 12.05, a bit later than that now. 12.08. 12.08 to 12.18 maybe to get to Tottenham for a 12.20 departure. We might be able to do that. Just 
just about. I'm not sure if this peak might be powering a little bit. Oh, that's not the right button. This section is beautiful on a uh, summer's evening when the sun's just setting at this end of the valley. It's absolutely stunning. One of my favourite places to be in real life. It's uh, such a peaceful sort of valley, especially if you're on the other side where there's no roads and stuff. And you can see the trains going along. I always remember when I was a kid, the, the, there's a pub, I think it's called the Coombe Cellars, where my parents used to take me and used to be able to be uh, on an evening this year, a China clay working with 37s. And you could hear them coming away from Newton Abbott and all the way along the entire estuary. It was absolutely epic. It's after those days are no more, but this uh, railway we're lucky enough still to have. So just gradually shut off power. Ready for the 60 mile an hour limit, which is on the curve just before the sidings at uh, Hackney Yard. The sidings in 1980 would have still been quite busy, I believe. Although I don't know much of the history of them. Now, this is where the biggest changes on the route will, will be, obviously, is that Newton Abbott in this route with TS um, and Avail Life today is a really simple free platform station. The yard's still quite big at Hackney but it doesn't really see any use. But um, New Nova Station, when this scenario was based in 1980, uh, still had its uh, extra platform which is now part of the car park um, and it still had the works and the depot and stuff uh, and carriage sidings. Unfortunately that's all gone now. The uh, fourth platform went during the uh, 80s when they re-signalled everything around here. It's quite sad really because I suppose that platform, you never know, could have been useful. I mean, there was still a lot of traffic, holiday traffic and stuff in those days. There wasn't as many holiday additionals and stuff like that, but there was still a lot of traffic. The additionals on the summer Saturdays and stuff uh, sort of petered out almost completely in the early 2000s. Still get a lot of traffic today, but nowhere near like what they used to be, especially in steam days. In the 1950s, there would be well over 100 services a day along here, and that's where the Thunderbird used to stand on the right hand side over there in that bay platform. And that was after the modifications in the 1980s, so maybe that's why they started actually using it for that purpose because until the 1980s there used to be a platform down the back and a goods loop there as well. It's a slight overshoot. Almost right. So we have arrived at 12.08, be about 12.09 departure. And we've got the climb of Dainton to come, which will be good. Always is. Interesting that we've been routed into this platform. I know that the service in real life would have been booked down this platform, I guess. Um, but that would have been when the platform arrangement and stuff in Newton was a bit different back in the day because they obviously took our junction out after the modifications of the 1980s with the signal boxes, which I'll go into in a minute. Mm. Right, now I need to get on my driving. I'm just going to shut up for a second and uh, turn the volume up so I can hear the 50.
crossing back over onto the uh, down main. Lines on the left go down to uh, Painton. So we're just waiting for the back of the train now to clear those points. That's how they have the up. Okay. Yep. So we're away now. We're trying to get up to 60 mile an hour now before we hit Dainton. That is the uh, target. Don't want to be starting Dainton at less than 60 if we can help it. So this is where they are, this is now called the Hour Divergence, uh, it used to be called Hour Junction and you would actually be on the left hand side I believe if I remember rightly and you would come around on a, a wider sort of curve and these two lines with the painting lines you should cross across to go straight down there. So they made it, when they took the signal box out and the signals out they made it into just a divergence where this line swings around to the right on a super elevated curve which obviously meant that the speed limit increased to 60. Um, sensible decision really and they move the junction back towards uh, New and Abbott the one downside that there is is that it's actually a single track connection off the off the Tor Bay line now there's a small bit where it goes to one track so that bit obviously um, means that there's a little bit of a bottleneck on, especially in the old days and the busy summer Saturdays that there still was up to the early 2000s. And indeed, even on summer Saturdays today, there's still a few extras that go there. We're speeding slightly, but I can't have to show off because I know the gradient is going to significantly go up in a minute. I'm not sure why there was an AWS ramp there. Maybe a small bug in the boot. Speed's already dropping now on the Bowling 57 as we climb now towards Stonicum. Stonicum's where there used to be a quarry connection to the uh, quarry on the left there. Awful lot of lorry traffic on the roads now because of this uh, quarry. But it used to be quite a sort of funny. It must have been a difficult junction and quarry to work here. There actually used to be a signal box on the right here as well at Stonicum. And I think it's actually still there, maybe alive. It's just there on the right. And we're now on the clouds at Dainton. The signal sections on this section are actually still the same, I believe, pretty much as the were when it was semaphores. They're on a slight changes. We're now just uh, sort of last half mile of the climb to Dainton. And the summit of the bank is actually in the middle of the tunnel up here. There seems to be some semaphores just this side of the tunnel as well as on the other side. Go for the classic viewpoint as we approach. Over the summit into the tunnel. Already going to start easing the power off because we'll gain speed really quickly in the one in 36, I think it is down this side. Uh, and this is where the Dainton signal box used to be on the left hand side, just there. And what a great box that must have been to work when you can see down this section of track here and see Locos climbing up this one in 43, one in 36, I think it's just down here. Must have been an amazing sight, especially in steam days with the dramatic, dramatic sort of exhaust and everything. One in thirty-eight. This bit. As we come through Coombe Fish Acre, and I always. Uh, Personally, I always love this section of your life when you're going along, sort of leaning through the curves and everything. Got a great feel about it.
Still trying to get a decent screenshot. I don't think I've managed to get one yet. A little ride in the compartment. So one thing I do love about this route is the way that Simon's crafted all the uh, farmland and stuff. I think it's really, really nice. And we're just about to drop off the uh, end of Dainton Bank now, coming towards where it levels out a bit for the last few miles into Totnes. Tornus our last stop of course before we get to Blumoth. So is this section when you're on a steam tour, because of the long sections up Rattery, if the driver smile, which obviously the drivers generally are, but if the driver smile knows the uh, route well, particularly the DB drivers, and I noticed Ray Churchill of West Coast has done it as well in the past particularly or slow down if they know they're following something so if they've let a HST pass at Newton Abbott and have followed it up here if they've had a good climb up Dainton they will go really slow down Dainton all the way along here until they get a green signal just before Totnes if they get a green signal there they know then they should be clear hopefully through Totnes uh, and quite often they actually request in the past they used to request that Exeter Box hold them before Totnes if the signal at the far end of Totnes wasn't going to be clear because if the signal at the far end of Totnes isn't clear it means a standard start on a 1 in 60 climb, 1 in 50 climb of Rattery. So if they were going to be stopping at uh, that point, i.e. if the HST hadn't cleared Rattery yet, they would actually ask the signal box exit to hold them at the next signal we're going to pass after that one. And quite a few times I've come down here at like on a steam tour at like 30 miles an hour and you get stopped just outside Totnes for a few minutes. I think there's only two occasions when I've gone straight through here and then they've got a yellow signal at Totnes in the middle road and ended up stopping by the churchyard just outside Totnes. Uh, one occasion was with Nunny Castle which managed to start his train and uh, real slog up the bank but managed it and the second was Oliver Cromwell about eight years ago, nine years ago and that uh, slipped to a stand about just before Tigley. Uh, Ray Churchill was driving that and he actually got it going again though from a standing start on the 1 in 50 which was really impressive. And the only other time I've stalled behind steam on Rattery was uh, 6024 again at Tigley about, uh, I would say about 18 years ago maybe not quite like that long, maybe 15 years ago actually. That was Jeff Ewins driving. That was an impressive uh, restart as well because he, he again managed to restart it from a stand. I don't think there's anything better than having a castle over uh, Dainton though and Rattery. Especially on its own. Earl Bathurst, I think it was about 2004. It was absolutely amazing up here. Diesel wise, the climbs are good, but they're just not enough of a challenge, really. Unless you're on something really low powered. I mean, I've had some good climbs with uh, 37s over the years. 37411 had a good climb over this uh, section with. But most of the powered full diesels, like Deltics and such as this, they don't really notice it. So yeah, if a steam driver comes through here and he has a yellow in the middle road, he's uh, really not going to be a happy person. And you can see on the uh, hood at the bottom, the signal in 0.7 miles, you can actually see the gradient. It starts literally off the platform end here. I 
And if you get a yellow here, you're in for some big problems. Especially if it's wet. If you dry, you're not too bad, but then you've actually got the problem of friction uh, in a steam loco, and that causes additional issues. Luckily, us in our class 50, we should be just fine. Even though we got that hunk of metal behind us. Bloody heat. Wrong with you. Oh. Coupling gin. Barked. I would love to see a 1980s version of this room. Do a bit of cap hanging for the climb up here. So it's a 25 mile an hour limit out of the loop. And we're already on a 1 in 88, 1 in 77, 72. Yeah, literally come to a 1 in 50. Just after the bridge in the distance. Now we're running 62 gradient. So we're now on the 60 limit again. 1 in 50, 1 in 49, 47. So as I said, if you've got a yellow, and a, even on the diesel, in bad, bad adhesion, if you've got a yellow at that signal back there, you don't want to be stopping at this signal here. The sections are so long over uh, Dartmoor that it's really it takes quite a while for the trains to get to the next signal from uh, Totnes. Because even HSTs obviously it takes a while to get up to speed going up here back in the day. Um, the 800s, I've not, I think I've only had one 800 over here to be fair, so I can't uh, speak for them. Fifty's doing all right. Thirty-nine mile an hour accelerating on the one in forty-seven. It's amazing how sort of like the foliage could get quite a lot around here. You'd think when they know it's on a steep hill that they would have always kept this bit cut back to ensure that uh, the adhesion's a bit better. It's a weird one where they would ever let it even get overgrown in the first place. I know that in recent years they've actually done quite a lot of foliage clearance on this section. So we're still on the 1 in 50, so you can really see why steam trains want a good run at this climb. Especially when they're near the uh, limits of what those locos are capable of. And sometimes I've been quite long trains, like 8 or 9 coaches. Occasionally even more than that as well. Now swing around towards Tigley, and Tigley is where the uh, climb actually eases. Although the bank itself is called or well known as Rattery, it actually finishes at Tigley um, rather than Rattery. In terms of the really steep bit, it steepens again as you get a little bit further on. But it's Tigley where the challenging bit ends, and that's just sort of around the next left-hand bend. You can see the church just over the trees there, uh, and that's obviously a landmark as you're on the train. You sort of know once you level with the church that you're on the section where the track actually levels out a bit. The 20 miles to Plymouth. I 
be about 20 minutes because the uh, limit's 60 odd over here so we're not quite doing even time at the moment. And back onto the steeper section again and then it'll ease again in a minute. It's just as you come along this bit here you sort of go past the church as we are doing now on the hand side. And I believe it's just somewhere here where it eases. Somewhere on this next straight I think. Just there you can actually see the, the change. There's a 50 heading the other way. It's now one in ninety. And what we're doing here is we're climbing up onto the edge of Dartmoor. We don't really go up over Dartmoor. Dartmoor itself being sort of that way that I'm looking at the moment. You can sort of see the hills in the front of us as well. On the opposite side of Dartmoor to where the southern took their line through Wolverhampton. This just skirts the edge as you go around Argy Bridge. Now it's a 52 mile an hour. Gradually accelerating as we're going up on the one in 96 now. You can see on the hood of the tunnel. Slowly approaching. And that's where the summit of sorts is, although the actual line continues to climb until you get to, I believe it's Rangerton. screenshots across the viaduct. If only this viaduct was so easy to photograph in real life. It's hidden behind a load of trees I think. Now when there's a tunnel which does signal that they were uh, over the main bit. After the tunnel we drop down for a bit, a bit before we uh, continue the climb. Class 50s in this line, of course, is what really saw the hydraulics off on this section when they when the 50s moved from the Midland region to the Western region. The door had decided, obviously, they're getting rid of the Western region stuff at that point, but the hydraulics stuff at that point, but these were the replacements for the Westerns, I guess. Although they are quite unpopular in terms of how they're, you know, how they're taken by enthusiasts. When they were working, they did quite a good job. Certainly powerful engines. Uh, the jumbo trains that used to go over here used to have like uh, 14 coaches on with a single 50. Must have been some good fresh on those. I know that when that working used to get allocated to a 47, as far as I know, they used to actually put a pair of 47s on to do the 50s job. So now we're just curving around through South Brent, and this is where the line to Kingsbridge used to go off, used to come in from the left here behind us, and this is where the station was, quite a big station, junction station, you can clearly see sort of there in that cutting where it was, 
And as I said, we're now skirting down while you can see all the hills up on the top there. We'll shortly be passing uh, Asia Merger to Crossover. I'm not sure if this is the first signal we've actually passed since Rattery. I can't remember if there's one right at the top as well. I know there isn't many. But you can sort of see why it's such a... You can't really time trains close together on this section. I mean, you'd think really they'd do something about it. Increase capacity uh, quite a lot, really. Certainly when there's delays and stuff. Small rise in the gradient here, just get a bit of power down for a bit. I used to always love when you were still allowed to uh, look out the window, so I used to love looking out the back window along this section and seeing the low coast swinging around every curve. Of course, you can't do that these days due to health and safety, but it uh, used to be fantastic. There's only about three or four times I've ever been hit in the face by tweaks on all the uh, trips I went in over the years. And it is dangerous at the end of the day, it's just uh, a common sense thing really. And it's a shame that it is essentially a few idiots that have ended up getting it banned for everybody. But there's been some tragic circumstances as well, and I think when those happen, it's always going to be the end of the uh, the road for it. Obviously, there was a couple of tragic incidences in the last five years or so, which uh, unfortunately saw it uh, no longer be a viable thing for people to be doing, which is understandable. I love those views there, I know. The most dangerous thing I've ever found about leaning out windows is stuff flying from exhausts, especially steam locos with coal and stuff. But even on diesels you can get you know, shards of carbon and stuff flying out and get in your eye. I think I've been to hospital, I think it was about four times I've been with a soot lodged under my eyelids. Quite painful. That's the worst experiences I've had with window hanging. I used to always wear uh, goggles after a couple of instances. Like, uh, some people used to wear swimming goggles, some people used to wear full ski masks to look out the window. I used to just go for like a pair of industrial specs sort of thing. I've even seen a few people look out using well uh, full crash helmets. Is this Ivy Bridge station? Very basic. It's just 11 miles now to Plymouth, so about 5 miles till we get to Hamilton. Uh, there's HST going the other way. No Paddington bound 1.
So we are now gradually going downhill to Plymouth. Coming down from Haddar Moor. Still on the very edge of it. This must look amazing going around these curves. It's this corn with our adduct. I really like how this has been captured in Train Sim. Certainly one of my favourite routes. I am biased because I love this area of the country, so. It's just such a beautiful area. Bad mark left the tail lights on. Another viaduct coming up. You can see Dime all over there on the right hand side actually now. Up towards the higher parts. And that signalling just over a mile is the ones on the approach towards Hemmerdon Summit, which is where we go down the 1 in 42. So a really steep hill down into Plymouth. It's always been a challenge and always will be. I'm led to believe that the 800s are quite impressive up there. Just going to give a little tap on the power again to get us back up to 60, ready for top of Emmerdon when we uh, see there in the mile. The limit goes back up to 80 because it's quite a long straight down towards Plymouth from Tavistock Junction. This is Hemmerdon, so this is where there's actually a good loop as well. It's very rarely used these days. They used to be one on the left hand side, I think, in real life. That's now gone. See it in the bushes there, but it's no longer in use. The one on the right, I think, still does get used because of the freights that come up, obviously, and end up quite slow. And get over to 80 miles now, we're down here now. See if we're going to be in Plymouth by 12.45. Don't worry, I doubt we will be to be honest, I think it will be 12.46. I'm 
Oh, I'd up to 80 miles an hour. Nearly at the bottom of the bank now. Sixty mile hour is sixty mile an hour limit just in a second while we go around the sharp curve at uh, Tavistock Junction. Tavistock Junction is where there's quite a big yard. I think it used to be a speedling yard though, I'm not entirely sure on that. It was certainly a, a big yard in in back in the day because there used to be quite a lot of little freight branches at Plymouth. The Friary branch and uh, some of the ones on the south side of the river I cannot remember the name of. Well, the, I think it's the Plim Valley Valley goes off to the right over there as well. There used to be some trip workings around here. I think they used to be used by uh, used to be done by a shunting loco in 08. Or in 09. So we're gonna get the power open. For those that watch Tom's streams are coming up to the famous point just after level where he managed to spad one of the scenarios that I did for him. And uh, I kind of had a rage quit at that point. Still an audit about that for you know, over a year later. One of these days I might forgive him for it. We we're coming along here and he got a double yellow at this next signal. Put the power on. Got a single yellow, kept the power on. Then got a red and I was surprised that he got a red. Needless to say, wasn't best pleased, but uh, come to expect it with him. Bless him. That on the left there is where Lever Scrap Line used to be, where many of these 50s ended up for quite a while, including I guess 50 to 8 I would imagine. Lever Depot on the left hand side there, home of the class 50s for many years, not many of them anyway. This signal that Tom managed to spad on a 1 and 83 uphill gradient on a freight train, but yeah. Great game, mate. I'm going to take the power off, let the gradient take our speed away for this 55 limit, then drop the brakes in for the 25 limit. And this is where we steam locos going back towards Exeter. They really try to power down this climb here back down the gradient to uh, make sure they get hammered in at 60 mile an hour at the bottom. Oh, yeah. 60 to 70 miles an hour anyway. Got a yellow, which means we've got the road into the station. It's 
quite a steep drop into New into Plymouth North Road Station. Platform six, we're booked into. Which I forgot was meant we'd be thrown across there. I probably should have slowed down a bit more. Try and get another screenshot since so I've just taken a lot of crap ones so far. Twelve forty six arrival, so wasn't able to do the twelve forty five, which doesn't surprise me. I'm not sure if Sinks has actually got this scenario set into a platform long enough for the train. I don't think he has. Probably should have been in seven. 8 or one of the ones to the left, I would say 7 or 8, but maybe, yeah 7 or 8 because it's a uh, cross country working from the north. Oh is it just that the mark, oh, it's just that the mark is not extended. Sorry Mr Sinks. I do apologise for throwing the blame at you. Well that was enjoyable, anyway I enjoyed that. Look at that oversized peak. It was an undersized 50. I would say it's an oversized peak, no one who made it, but... Um, anyway, hope you enjoyed the video, guys. I certainly enjoyed making it. This uh, scenario pack is a 1980 scenario pack by Sinks. It's available from Sinks of Stuff. You'll find the link for the website that uh, Sinks hosts his fantastic scenarios on in the description of this video. And uh, very much, you know, very big thanks to Sinks for making this pack. It's 10 scenarios, 12 hours, and it's completely free as well, so... Oh, you are tight. It's brilliant. It's just well worth uh, a good play. He's got a wide variety of scenarios in there 31s, 50s, HSTs, pretty much uh, sort of across the border what would have been running down there for the 80s sort of period. Uh, it's a very good pack by the looks. Certainly enjoyed this. Please don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification bell as well. Really appreciate your support as always. And uh, please do, everyone, say it. Stay safe and. Uh, Stay home during this period. Hopefully we'll all be back to normal soon. Don't forget Tom's usually live on Twitch. He's supposed to be Wednesdays and Fridays, but he seems to have gone like uh, mad these days and just says he sort of streams whenever. So we'll see when he streams. But it's supposed to be Wednesdays and Fridays at uh, half seven, uh, eight o'clock. And you'll find him linked in the description below. Thanks very much for watching, guys. See you later. Goodbye.